God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Greetings. Welcome to today's worship for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Van Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. As you may recall during this season, while our focus in worship is always on God and the gifts we have through Christ, we're taking a close look at the response to God by the people of faith and sometimes by people who are faithless. Today's scripture sheds light on this in some very dramatic ways. For those of us who are watching online, I encourage you to follow along in your Bible as we read today's scripture, whether you are using the same translation as I am, which is the New International Version, or some other translation. One thing is clear in these days and times. If ever we needed healing, it is now. Globally, in our government, in our communities, among the various groups of people who make up our world, in our hospitals, in the very air we breathe. We need healing that only God provides. The good news is that healing does come, and in many ways, and always originating from God. How open we are to the opportunity for healing can make all the difference as to whether or not we receive the healing that comes from God. Does that sound strange? Perhaps. But it is true, our reception and our perception can make all the difference in the matter of healing. More on this as we enter today's worship. Let's begin with prayer. Great healer, holy physician, Lord, we come to you not as we wish we were, not as we want others to see us, but as we know ourselves. We come to you much more fragile than we thought we were 15 months ago. Slowly, reluctantly, we come to the realization that the world and we, your people, are breakable. How we live, how we treat your creation, and how we treat one another, for better or for worse, it all has long-term effects. We break things. We break ourselves, and we find out that the mending comes slowly. We're not even sure if everything we break can be mended, and so we bring ourselves to you today. Teach us how to live in this world, how to live with others, even how to live with ourselves without always dropping and breaking things. Teach us how to care, how to be full of compassion, how to be careful. And then when the inevitable happens and we cannot mend ourselves, remind us who can and who does. Show us your hands, the hands of Christ. Give us faith to trust those hands, those healing hands Teach us humility to come to you without fanfare or fancy words, but with hearts open to your grace, and to learn that healing and faith go hand in hand. In whatever manner your healing comes, Lord, give us eyes to see, joyful hearts to receive. For we pray in the name of Christ who healed long ago and who heals today. Amen. His mother died when he was two. His father raised him. Although he wasn't born a slave, he was often hired out to work alongside slaves in order to bring in enough revenue to help his father who struggled to make ends meet. Unlike slaves, Charles Tindley was able to go home at the end of the day. Self-taught, he eventually acquired and thoroughly read over 8,000 books, including the classics. He eventually took classes in Greek and Hebrew in order to study scripture in the original tongue. Before his retirement, he pastored and built up a multi-ethnic congregation of 10,000 worshipers. Most of the hymns he wrote have to do with personal sin and the struggles people face in life. Leave It There is one of those hymns. If the world from you withhold Of its silver and its gold And you have to get along with meager fare Just remember in his word How he feeds the little bird Take your burden to the Lord And leave it there Leave it there, leave it there, just 
Take your burden to the Lord Oh, and leave it there If you trust and never doubt He will surely bring you out Take your burden to the Lord And leave it there If your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain And your soul is almost sinking in despair Jesus knows the pain you feel He can save and He can heal Take your burden to the Lord And leave it there Leave it there Just take your burden to the Lord, oh, and leave it there. If you trust, never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord, and leave it there. And when your enemies assail, and your heart begins to fail, don't forget that God in heaven answers prayer. He will make a way for you, and He will lead you safely through. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Just take your burden to the Lord, oh, and leave it there. If you trust, never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord, and leave it there. When your youthful days are done, and old age is stealing on, and your body bends beneath the weight of care. He will never leave you then. He will go with you to the end. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord, oh, and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord, and leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord, and leave it there. Scripture for today is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? 
You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. May God add his blessings on the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Well, in case you haven't figured it out, Jesus spent a lot of time in a boat. They say the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, for Jesus, the shortest distance from one town to another was by sea, a straight line across versus walking the circumference of the Sea of Galilee. Well, this time, upon landing on the opposite shore, Jesus is immediately met by a man named Jairus. Now, Jairus was not just anyone. Jairus was well known. He was wealthy. He was a prominent leader in the synagogue. He was the kind of man that if he told you to do something, there was no question whether or not you did it. If he said jump, you would say, how high? He was important, a man of influence and power. As a synagogue leader, Jairus structured the life and culture of his community, whose life centered around the synagogue. Any question as to whether or not a thing should or should not be done, any time people wanted to know what they could or could not, should or should not do, all of it was vetted through Jairus, you see. He could tell you what to do, when to do it, and how. He was the local benevolent chief authority figure. Somewhat difficult for us to picture since you and I operate on a democratic principle in church matters, at least here in in our church with representative committees. But imagine this. Imagine the UMW, the United Methodist Women of our church, have decided to host the bazaar. Imagine they are going to go for it or have some version of it. Isn't that, I think that's what we're planning on doing this year. And imagine that they have decided to can meat for chicken and beef noodles, okay? In fact, I. I don't think we have to imagine that. that it's happening, isn't it? So the time comes and they are set up for canning meat. They're in the kitchen getting things ready. And right at that time, yours truly walks into the kitchen and tells them, we're going to can tuna instead of chicken and beef this year. We're going to do tuna this time. We're going to do it a little bit different. Forget the beef and chicken. I've been inspired and this year we're going to can tuna. How do you think that would go down? Well, they'll conclude that the pastor's lost his mind, of course. You don't tell the UMW to can tuna when they're going to can beef and chicken, do you? They have that authority, not me. Same thing with Jairus. Only Jairus had complete authority, not only in regards to matters in the synagogue, but in regards to how that impacted community life. Jairus was a powerful man. Life has a funny way of turning tables on us, doesn't it? One day you're on top of the world, and the next day the world's on top of you. Jairus realizes this in one of the most vulnerable ways a parent can experience. His daughter, his little girl, was ill, extremely ill. Scripture says she was at the point of death. Any delay in healing could easily cost her her life. And Jairus knew this. He therefore put aside his status, his importance, his power and prestige, his authority, knowing there was absolutely nothing he could do to help his girl. But he knew who could. Throwing all pride out the window, he approaches Jesus, gets down on his knees, and begs Jesus to heal her. It's a moving scene. And surprising, given the fact that not long ago, Jesus performed a healing in a nearby synagogue on the Sabbath and got in a lot of trouble for that. And as a synagogue leader, Jairus would know that a plot to kill Jesus was actively being conspired. But none of that mattered now that his little girl lay at death's door. And so he humbled himself. It's interesting 
to note that when he fell at Jesus' feet, how Jesus could have taken advantage of the Father's predicament. Jesus could have pressured the man to acknowledge who Jesus was. He could have made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I'll heal your little girl if you swear allegiance to me. I'll heal your little girl if you advocate for my ministry. I'll heal for your little girl if you give generously to the Disciples of Jesus Fund. I'll heal your little girl if you first fall down and worship me as the Christ, the Son of God. I'll do this if you do that. But that's not the way Jesus worked. He was not a quid pro quo savior. He simply saw a desperate man in a desperate situation and a poor little girl and he pleading for her life. And he responded. He saw a man who was humble and that's all he needed to see. One of the things I've been taught time after time is that you get a lot farther down the road with humility than you do with pride. They say confession is good for the soul. Here's my confession for the day. In my younger days, I used to have a lead foot when it comes to driving. If I was anxious or impatient or cutting corners and not giving myself enough time to get from one place to another, I would drive faster than I should. I admit it. Every now and then, I still need to remind myself that the world doesn't end if I'm a minute late. Knock on wood, as of today, I have not been ticketed for any tra traffic violations since, I think, 1993, 28 years. Folks, for me, that's pretty good. I know there's some of you who have never been ticketed, and I'm so happy for you. You can tell me about that later if you want to, but in 2012, I was in a hurry. It was raining, and I was going faster than I should, and in no time at all, the flashing red lights were right behind my car. I pulled over, rolled down my window while the rain poured in on me. The officer asked for my license, vehicle registration, and then asked if I knew why he pulled me over. They always ask if you know why they pulled you over, don't they? He asked me if I knew, and I, I knew that first impressions are very important, especially when talking to a police officer, and I had already made a bad impression with my driving. He asked the question, and I therefore said, Officer, I have no excuse. I must have been going faster than I should have. I'm sorry. Officer said, well, just wait right here. He went back to his squad car a few minutes later, came back to me and said, Mr. Dickens, I'm going to give you a warning. It's not a speeding ticket. It's a warning. You can come to the courthouse next week at such and such time, talk with the judge, and he will expunge the warning from your record, and there'll be no penalty, just a warning. Drive safely. You may go. I thanked him profusely and went on my merry way, gratefully relieved. Didn't try talking my way out of it, didn't deny what I had done. He gave me a break. One of the legendary stories in my family is about my mother, though, who had never been issued a traffic citation in her life and who was very proud of that. Uh, and when they first moved to Austin, my mother and father were driving around house hunting, house hunting. They were looking at all those nice homes in a certain subdivision when she drove by a school at the time when the speed limit dropped down to 15 miles per hour. She was concentrating on the houses and didn't realize she was going through a school zone. And before she knew it, an officer pulled her over with the lights behind her. Well, the officer approached her window, asked for her license and registration, and asked if she knew why she was being pulled over. Mom said, no, I have no idea. Mom said, we were just looking at all these beautiful houses. We're new here, you see. We're from out of town, and, and we're planning to move here, and it's such a nice day. I just didn't realize we were going through a school zone. Officer excused herself and came back a few minutes later with her traffic citation tablet. And as she was writing my mother up, my mother said, but, but we're new here. We, we don't know the area. Officer said nothing. But officer, I have never had a ticket before. Officer looked at her, nodded her head and said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you this ticket, ma'am. Mom began tearing up. She looked at the officer as if to to say something, and then she said, you mean you're gonna give me a ticket? Yes, ma'am, I'm afraid so. Why? why, why that hurts my feelings. Officer said, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Welcome to Austin, have a nice day, drive safely. 
when I asked her to tell that story, Mom said what upset her the most was the fact that she no longer had a clean record. What upset my father was, cost us $300. I don't know if the outcome would have been any different had she responded any other way, but I am convinced that you and I get a lot farther down the road being humble than we do being proud. When Jairus approached Jesus, it was without an ounce of pride. He didn't matter that the other religious leaders were out to get Jesus. All he knew was that if anyone could heal her, it was him. So he got down on his knees and begged for his daughter's sake. And Jesus went with him. But this is where the story gets really interesting. No sooner does Jesus begin making his way to the house of Jairus to heal his daughter when another man who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, uh, another woman, uh, for 12 years approaches Jesus. Who was she? She could have been anybody. In some ways, she's a lot like us. Think of it. Tired of waiting in line. Tired of making appointments with doctors. She'd been to many doctors countless times, hoping they could cure her. And isn't that the way it goes? Seems the older you get, the longer the list of ailments. I read this week, as one man in his 70s put it, after a certain age, you never really get well. You just get less sick. After working with insurance companies that may or may not cover the treatment, after all the red tape of doctor's appointments and different treatment plans, healing can often be a lot more complicated and elusive the older we get. And in the case of this woman, she had been seeking a cure for 12 years, treatment after expensive treatment until she was broke. They had taken all her money and nothing was working. She was worse. Not only this, but unlike the little girl, she was not the daughter of a wealthy, prominent citizen. She was not anyone special. All we know is she believed Jesus could heal her with a single touch, even if it was just touching the hem of his garment. And so she did something she would otherwise never think of doing. Pushing through the crowd, she reached out and touched his cloak and was immediately healed. Sensing what happened, Jesus spins around and shouts, who touched me? Nobody understood why he said that, but as the Son of God, he would know that healing power had just gone forth from him. The woman fears she is about to be punished for her boldness. Any woman in her condition was considered unclean, you see, and here she was in a crowd rubbing up against people, making everyone around her ritually unclean, including Jesus, whose clothes she had just touched. Who touched me? She confesses. Fearing the worst, she confesses, I'm the one. I'm the one who touched you. She tells her story and in the telling reveals the violation she had just committed by stepping into the crowd and touching him as someone who is by the Mosaic law unclean. In a manner of speaking, this is the only story where someone steals a healing from Jesus. The only story where Jesus unintentionally heals someone. But despite this, despite the law she violated, despite the rules she broke, the story reveals an even deeper truth that this woman believed he could heal her. And because of this, when she declares herself as the guilty party who touched him, when she humbles herself, Jesus calls her daughter. Not thief, not no name, but daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. I'm going to take it back. It's yours to keep. Go in peace. There's a great mystery when it comes to healing. Why are some people apparently healed while others are not? At one point, Jesus explained to his followers how the sun rises on the evil and the good and sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous. It's the nature of God's grace. We should never be confused about God's love and grace when it comes to the subject of healing. Still, there's a mystery to it. This much we know. Faith and healing go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. If you go through life 
distrusting God's goodness. If you go through life convinced there is no healing for you, and you won't be healed. It will eventually, eventually kill you. It will spiritually kill you and it will physically kill you. Our God is a healing God, a loving, healing God. But the healing only comes to those who trust it, who trust that healing and who are open to it. And the healing comes in many ways. Sometimes it comes in the way you were hoping it would come. A woman reaches out and touches the hem of his garment and immediately she is healed. Instantly. That happens. Other times the healing comes in a different way. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul and that thorn in his flesh he wrote about. We don't know what the thorn was. A skin problem, an inflammation of the eyes, epilepsy. We don't know. But he asked God to remove the thorn three times. The Lord answered him saying, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I'm thinking of those dear souls I've known who manifest the love of God and make a powerful witness in the midst of their infirmity when they could easily be bitter, the way Job's wife who told her husband to curse God and die was people who humble me with their depth of faith. Sometimes the healing comes in ways we don't expect. Sometimes the type of healing God gives is not what we thought it would be. But later we see it through the eyes of faith for the healing it is. I'm thinking of families who have lost loved ones and the healing that comes in time as they turn to the Lord and how grief turns into gratitude for all the memory of that special person and the difference they made in their lives. Such healing comes with faith. Faith and healing. They go hand in hand. Finally, after the woman who touched Jesus is healed, Jesus then makes his way to the home of Jairus and his little girl. But Alas, it's too late now. He missed the opportunity. The ritual mourners gather around Jairus. They tell him it's too late. She's dead. For a lot of us, it appears that it's too late. Jairus turns to, Jesus turns to Jairus and tells him, don't fear, only believe. And here's the difference. When Jesus tells the crowd that the little girl is, dead, is not dead, but sleeping, they laugh at him. When you laugh with someone, you are enjoying the moment along with them. But when you laugh at someone, you mock them, you scorn them. And because of this, there would be no healing that day for them to see. He takes the mother and father inside along with Peter, James, and John as eyewitnesses to sort of groom them for future ministry. Takes the little girl by the hand and tells her to get up. The crowd was convinced there was no future for this girl anymore. But the Lord saw things differently. The little girl gets up and eats. He then tells those in the home to share it with no one. Now, many have wondered, why would he do that? It's not that it didn't happen, the raising of her. It did. A little girl lived again. It's that some people choose to believe in Jesus because of all the miracles, the wonderful things he can do, but not because of who he is, and not because they trust him. Faith is believing not so much in miracles, but in Him. The healing follows. Sometimes it comes in dramatic ways. Other times it is revealed as if through a dim mirror that slowly gets clearer as time goes by. When Jesus told the little girl to get up, the Aramaic word He spoke to her when translated is the same word used to refer to the resurrection, His resurrection. Rise. For those who put their faith in Him, 
the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who take him at his word. There is both healing in this world and in the world to come. To us and to all who love him, he says, rise. And there is healing. Risen Lord, we come to you today and place our lives in your trustworthy hands. Whatever problems we have, whatever burdens we bear, whatever wounds and illnesses that need healing, we give them over to you and take you at your word. And may the healing that comes from you give us peace and hope and joy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Leave it there, leave it there, just take your burden to the Lord, oh, and leave it there. If you trust, never doubt, He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord, and leave it there. Go in peace. May the faith God gives us bring us the healing we need through Jesus Christ our Savior and with the power of his Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless and keep you.